You're entering a world of awkwardness. A world of overused characters and cliches. A world where heavy acting is rewarded, and terrible effects are the norm. A world where plot devices are either over-explained or not explained enough. Behind that door is a river of blood. Behind that door are two scary little girls. Behind that door, a shitty remake that fucks it all up. You're about to enter the Stephen King miniseries. Okay, before you guys go nuts, I want to emphasize I don't hate Stephen King. He's a very talented writer and has written some very good stories. But that doesn't mean I had to like everything he's done. And on top of that, that doesn't mean that the movies and miniseries based on his books are that great either. Case in point, the Langoliers. This is one of those drawn-out miniseries from the mid-90s. Everybody was hooked, despite its incredibly goofy moments, but were then suddenly let down by one of the silliest payoffs ever. It's long, it's silly, it's over the top. It's a Stephen King miniseries. Let's take a look. So we see a bunch of people arriving at an airport in L.A. One of them is a little blind girl named Dinah, one is a woman named Laurel, and one is a British assassin hired to kill somebody. By who, you may ask? Well, by the director himself, Tom Holland. See you in London on Saturday. We'll have a pint to celebrate. Now you might be wondering why I know who Tom Holland is. Well, I did a little research and found out that he directed such movies as Child's Play and Fright Night. Why does this matter? It doesn't. It doesn't matter at all. They were silly movies then, and they're silly movies now. What's that? Why am I bringing it up then? Well, I guess I'm wondering why his name takes up two-thirds of the credits. I mean, holy shit, his name is huge. You got all these other people, who cares? Tom Holland! Outlined in shiny metallic lettering. It's bigger than Stephen King's name. Well, I guess if this is the same guy who brought us this... Thanos in the oven! <laughs> We're in good hands. By the way, while watching this opening, tell me you don't want to hear this music. The White Zone is for immediate loading and unloading of passengers only. There is no stopping in the Red Zone. There's also a pilot played by David Morris who's traveling to Boston as a passenger. So everybody boards the shamefully fake CGI plane and wakes up to a shocking surprise. Most of the people on the plane have just vanished. Would somebody speak to me, please? I'm sorry, but my aunt's gone, and I'm blind. It's all right. It's all right. What's wrong? Where is everybody? They've gone. They've all gone. What do you mean, where's everybody? They're all right here. Wait a minute, you just walked by ten rows and you didn't notice any of them didn't have people in it? I know you're a pilot, but surely you know planes are more full than this. Where is everybody? What's going on? Aunt Vicky! Aunt Vicky! Hey, what the hell is going on here? Will someone shut this brat up? Oh my god. Is that... It is! It's Falky from Perfect Strangers! Oh, oh Jesus, please tell me he gives an over-the-top performance! I have a meeting at Boston's Prudential Center at 9 o'clock this morning. Promptly at 9 o'clock. That's what's important. Oh, Lord. We thank you for this performance and the actor you have chosen to give it. Truly, he will supply great laughter for this review. So it turns out only a handful of people are left on the plane. All that's left of the other passengers are material items like watches and earphones. Even the pilots have disappeared. But does Balky care about this? Of course not, don't be ridiculous. Now I have three questions for you. Number one, who authorized an unscheduled stop? Number two, where was that stop made? And number three, why? You ever watch Mr. Spock on Star Trek? She said, if you don't shut your cake hole, you bloody idiot, I'll be happy to demonstrate his Vulcan sleep hole for you. Did he just make Star Trek sound badass? So he puts him in a nose hold. Don't believe me? Listen. Whoa, a nose hold. See? And that seems to shut him up for a while. Meanwhile, the pilot goes into the cockpit to see if he can radio for help. Air Force Control, this is American Pride, Flight 29. Do you read me over? What? But it turns out nobody's responding on the ground, and the pilot's too afraid to land in one of the busiest airports in the world. So where are they gonna go? No, we're heading to Bangor, Maine. Maine! I know we're not playing the Stephen King drinking game, but I don't care! I gotta take a drink to that! Oh, oh. What is your fetish with that place? And, of course, Balky doesn't like this at all. This is Bangor International Airport. It'll be our safest bet. 
I have an important business meeting in Boston this morning at 9 o'clock! My wide-angle lens is about to burst! And I forbid you! Would you please be quiet? You're scaring the little girl. Scaring the little girl? <laughs> scaring the little girl! Lady! Did he just get castrated on that line? Scaring the little girl? Scaring the little girl! Lady! Speaking of which, the little girl suddenly sees what Balky is seeing and discovers that most of his vision is distorted by scary imagery. No, I cannot eat cereal. It is very important. Ah! Of course, everybody wonders what the hell that was about, and the little girl explains. We all look like monsters to him. No. I'm sure we don't. What made you say that? I hear things sometimes. People's thoughts. She called it shiny. So yes, it turns out the little girl is psychic. Might as well add her to the unexplained psychic children's club that seems to exist in TV and movies. That's the craziest thing I ever heard. We also come across a mystery writer who's trying to deduce what is happening on this play. And oddly enough, he's exactly like a character out of a bad mystery novel. I also had been asleep. What about you, dear boy? Well, yeah. Yes. I'm a mystery writer. Deduction is my bread and butter. So I deduce that everyone was asleep, including all those people that were subtracted, along with the flight crew, of course, dear boy. Perhaps, dear boy, if I deduce a little bit more, my acting will become a little bit more shatter. Does anybody notice the teddy bear out on the plane? He looks suspiciously like the teddy bear from The Shining. The one that was giving a blowjob for some reason. Another Stephen King story. Coincidence or something more? I deduce dear boy. So they finally reach Maine and for some reason nobody wants to see what's actually down there. I really don't want to go down there. I'm scared stiff. God help us all. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea. I'm scared. What the hell's wrong with these people? You're on a plane where everybody disappeared. How the hell are you going to be safe there? Oh, no. There might be people down there to question us and want to solve our problem. Oh, the whore. Also, don't you just love how the adult is whining to the kid and the kid has to make her feel better? You know something, Diner? What? I really don't want to go down there. I mean, I really don't. If it'll make you feel any better. You're not the only one. <laughs> Don't worry, fully grown, mature woman. I, a terrified little blind girl, will keep you covered. Oh, thank you. <laughs> hey now, looks like somebody's getting a smooth landing over here. Set your shots into its full upright position. Oh, yeah. I don't want to die. I just don't want to die. And I don't want to say that line anymore, so we're just going to go with that take. But of course, they land just fine. And as is typical of Maine, it's weird, creepy, and totally filled with things that Stephen King is afraid of. This place smells wrong. Really badly wrong. I mean, we have to investigate. We don't have any choice. Why? Why do we have to? You know she's right. We should go back on the plane and wait to die. <laughs> Listen. There's nothing to smell and nothing to hear. Well, this is getting dull. Where's another wide-angle shot of Balky? There we go. You realize I can turn you in for this. Mr. Toomey, are you aware of what has happened to us? There are no excuses. Mr. Toomey, just terrible. Oh, hey! An obnoxious flashback and the crazy parrot! That's two Stephen King cliches in one! I don't want the hangover. Apparently, Balky has a flashback to when his father was angry because he got an A minus in class. An A minus? I got a trip to Chuck E. Cheese when that happened. What happens to lazy bums who lie down on the job, Craig? The angle ears get them. They will eat you alive, alive and screaming. Well, at least now we know where he gets his hammy acting from. You understand that the economic fate of nations may hinge on this meeting? Right now, I don't have the time. Time! What the hell do you know about time? Ask me about time! Ask me! Okay, I give him two more seconds before he fully transforms into a cartoon character. We all know it's coming. You can't hold it back. Ask 
Ask me about time! Ask me! <laughs> so again, they calm him down, and they go through the luggage conveyor belt. Why don't they just go through a door? They go inside and find that the place is abandoned. Plus, little things like smells and sounds have all been slightly muted. And it seems like the clocks have stopped, too. Spock! While that's going on, Balky starts to hallucinate about his father. You had an appointment in Boston. No, it wasn't my fault. I, I was kidnapped. There are no excuses! And they play the most common game in a Stephen King miniseries. Who can overact with their mouth open the widest? Well, I am going to explode, father, and I don't give a damn! You know what I did? Oh, not bad. Seven centimeters. Balky's dad's gonna have to really overact in order to beat that size. Love is not part of the big picture! Wow! An astonishing 12 centimeters! You can drive the Oscar Mayer truck through that hole! Congratulations, sir! You're the biggest overactor in this movie! I say that call for the dance of joy! <laughs> So as he goes through an airport security door, which of course isn't locked, Dinah swears she hears a creepy sound in the distance. So creepy that it forces her to take off her glasses even though it has no impact on her vision. Dinah, tell us what you hear. It's very faint. A really terrible, scary sound. And it's awful. A little like Rice Krispies after you pour in the milk. I'm sorry, what was that incredibly scary comparison again? A little like Rice Krispies after you pour in the milk. All right, put a search out for these guys. But be cautious, they are part of a complete breakfast. But I know it's closer than it was, because something's coming. There's something making that horrible cereal noise. Did this movie really just coin the phrase horrible cereal noise? This is a phrase that needs to exist? It's coming, don't you understand? It's coming! And if we have a gun by the time he gets here, we're all going to die. We're all gonna die a snappy, <laughs> crackling poppy death. <laughs> So we see Balky comes across another unlocked door where he finds a gun in one of the storage lockers. Well, if there's anything this movie is proving, is that airport security doesn't come down hard enough. You're out there, aren't you? But I'll be gone by the time you get here. I'm going to Boston. As you say, there's none of that stuff here. But when we woke up, it was on the plane. Well, does nobody see him right now? Maybe nobody was here when it happened. No, that's nonsense. Seriously, nobody sees him right now. You're looking right at him. Oh. Watch out, I hear someone. I hear him much better than you idiots can see him right in front of your fucking faces. You hear me? What is it? Take me to Boston. So Billy from Power Rangers attacks and gets shot. But luckily, bullets seem to have no effect in this world. So they get some rope and tie up the doofus before he acts any crazier. I think it might be wise to take a few precautions, don't you? <gasps> Do you have to be so rough? I mean, all we tried to do was kill somebody. That doesn't call for being rough. So this is all very riveting, but I think it's time for another Shatner performance. I think I found a fallacy in our thinking, and it is this. We all assumed as we began to grasp the dimensions of this event... God, I swear his pauses were written into the screenplay. I swear to God. I mean, let's count them. Let's count how many pauses are in this few seconds. I think I found a fallacy in our thinking, and it is this. We all assumed as we began to grasp the dimensions of this event that something had happened to the rest of the world. But the evidence doesn't bear that assumption out. What has happened has happened to us. Nine pauses. That's nine pauses! Can somebody just tell this idiot to get to the point? Please, Mr. Jenkins, can we get to the point? Every now and then, a hole appears in the stream of time. Not a time warp, but a, 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 a time rip. So he suggests that it might be a time rip that the plane flew into. But that it doesn't work like how most time travel movies say it works. That one can't appear 
in the Texas State School Book Depository on November 22nd, 1963, and hope to stop the Kennedy assassination. No, that would be a friggin' awesome storyline. This is the past. So if you could actually follow any of that, they had to find some fuel and escape fast, or else they'll vanish with the rest of time. Dinah, for whatever reason, decides she wants to find out more about these Langoliers that Balky was talking about. 